All right. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good uh, to, in a sense, be with you again this morning. And today, uh, we are back in Ephesians. We are in chapter 4. I'm actually going to read verses 1 through 16 for us. Uh, for this, we won't cover all of that. We've already covered the first six verses, uh, but we will not cover the rest. But uh, it's good to get the context. Uh, so turn your attention to the reading of God's word today. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we come under this word at this time, I pray that you would give wisdom, that you would help our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our, our hearts, that they would be soft to receive your word your good word for us today. I pray that you would empower me with your spirit. Father, I'm tired, but I'm excited to be able to proclaim your word. So I pray that your spirit would fill me, strengthen and empower me, that my words would be words of truth, words of blessing, words of grace, that they would be in keeping with sound doctrine. Father, grow us today through this word. We pray this for your glory and for our good and joy. Amen. Well, as you can tell, we're diving back into Paul's great letter to the Ephesians this morning. We are in that beginning portion of the second half of this letter. In the, uh, it's, it's that section that's moved into exhortation. It comes on the heels of Paul making it very clear what is true of believers because of Christ? What are the, the great privileges of those who are actually in Christ, united to him? The first half of this letter was primarily statements of truth, what we would call the indicative. And now we are more into that imperative section, the, the, the commands to, because of who you are in Christ, therefore live in light of what is true. And the chapter begins with a call. You heard that, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. First half of chapter four as a whole really um, has a a focus on the unity of the church. As believers, verse three says, we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's a unity that is grounded fully on the nature of the, uh, in the unity of the Trinity itself. Then we come to verse 7, and Paul, at first glance, seems to to move away from that unity into what seems to be more individualistic. But has he actually shifted his focus away from the unity of the church? Well, obviously, I, I don't believe that's the case. Paul's not advocating individualism, but he is speaking to how the church, um, in its um, diversity, is not some 
Stepford wife type of community, but the, that unity actually comes about in the diversity. You know, there is one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father, and, and all that. But what we have in that is not some lifeless uniformity. Christians are different from one another. We know that. We are individuals, but we're not for individualism. You know, that our individual, the, the fact that we are individuals is not opposed to the common life of the body of Christ and of the church. So from verses 7 to 16, Paul focuses on the church being built up, the church growing to maturity. And in our portion of that text, he views it through the lens, uh, lens of, of the, the gifts of Christ for the church. Now, we are only going to make it th- into verse 12 and, and not super in depth to that point. But in doing so, what we are going to see is we're going to see the giving of gifts And within that giving of gifts, we're going to see the giver of the gifts. And then we're going to move into a a purpose, a a massive purpose for those gifts. And my goal for this message is that we would see the wisdom of God and how uh, Christ has and is working to bring to maturity the church through his gifts. And on top of that, not only would we see that, but that we would be people who are readily participate in that means of maturity and that means of grace that he's given us. So verse seven, but grace was given to me, to each one of us, according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Here, Paul is addressing the the general gifting of believers. It's not that gift of salvation that he's already dealt with in the first half of this book. This is the fact that every member in the church is given a gift according to the measure of of Christ's gift. Now, Paul has already written, you see in 3.2, how um, he has received the gift of grace. He writes, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. And then down into verse 7 of chapter 3, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. He is saying that every member has been given a gift of God's grace. This is not something that's particular to Paul at all. 1 Peter 4.10, we read this. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The gifts that are given are, um, they arise from the manifold, the, the, the beautifully diverse grace of God. And, you know, I don't want us to slide past the idea of a gift too quickly, because when we think about um, this gift, gifts are not of our own skill or doing. And on top of that, ours, well, it's, it's not the only gift. It's one among many, and it's, to be, it's not to be viewed as, oh, I've got the best. I've got the be-all and end-all gift. And that gift, because it's from Christ, is actually to be used for the benefit of the church and the glory of God, everything working together. You know, I miss sports. I was greatly looking forward to March Madness, uh, to the Masters, and even over the past number of years, I've actually grown to, to be missing a little bit of baseball right now. And in virtually every sport, every team sport for sure, diversity utilized properly will actually yield a winning season. And I remember watching a a college soccer game earlier in the year, and uh, one play in particular that I saw was just absolutely gorgeous. It started in the backfield off a missed shot, and um, it was just this dance of absolutely precision passing uh, and beautiful team movement that, that moved that ball all the way up the field in mere seconds, and the final touch was actually just this super easy tap in because they had a perfect cross from the side, and and they they scored the goal, and it it was exquisite. And what happened is you saw 11 different players, all with different skill sets, all with different positions, flawlessly working together to achieve the goal that they had. Think of Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Or 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 
What we each are given by Christ is for the common good. These gifts are to be used. They are given as a gift of grace. Christ has, in his sovereignty and wisdom, distributed to each of us a gracious gifting for use in the body. And we must understand that. We must take comfort in that. We, we must be content in what he has given us. And we must use that gift. Now, being a gift, there are two things I, I want to draw out on that. First, what we have been given, and I just kind of alluded to this, we dare not withhold we, we, we can't withhold it from the body. It's come to us by Christ and is meant to be used and shared as a way to love our neighbor. It's actually a blessed privilege for us. And, but unfortunately, if we are honest, we are all guilty of withholding to, to some degree our gifting. And, and I will dare to say that I think that's sin, it, it's, a, it's certainly a sin of omission in us not using what God has given us. But I also wanna, want us to think about the positive side, not the fact that it's a sin when we don't, but on the positive side, how great a privilege it is for us to be able to, to use um, that gift that God has given, that Christ has given to us for the building up of his own body, for the strengthening of his body. And then second, I think what it also implies is that you cannot possibly grow without the church, without the rest of the gifts. I think Calvin put it better than I can. I I don't think that actually, I know that. He says, no member of the body of Christ is endowed with such perfection as to be able without the assistance of others to supply his own necessities. A certain proportion is allotted to each, and it is only by communicating with each other that all enjoy what is sufficient for maintaining their respective places in the body. Now, from that verse 7, Paul takes three verses and goes on what I think at first seems like maybe a bit of a rabbit trail. It's an aside that, that you're wondering perhaps why it's even here. And he says, he writes this, it says in verse 8, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led, host, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So what is this all about? Well, first we see that it is likely a reference to Psalm 68:18. That's it's universal really there and we we don't have time to study this psalm right now besides the fact that it's it's widely recognized as the most difficult psalm to understand the flow of thought and and to see where the writer is going. But I do believe we can grasp the the, the general thrust because it's a psalm that celebrates the victory and reign of God. God is the one who has delivered his people. He is the one of, who, of salvation who daily bears us up. He's ascended, he's reigning, and he received gifts of tribute from people. And then as the enthroned king, he distributes gifts and strength to his people. The last verse of that psalm. Now, Paul's quote of verse 18, when you look at it, is not exactly word for word. The text in the Old Testament reads, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men. There's actually a decent difference. So how do we account for that? Well, there are a number of theories that tackle this, but I'll tell you, none are 100% satisfying in how they deal with it. However, I do believe when one takes the overall meaning of the psalm, Paul's changing of from receiving to giving doesn't uh, go against the fabric of the text, the, the, the fabric of the thrust of it. He actually just highlights, I think, a different aspect of what the psalm is talking about. You see, Paul, Paul in how he viewed Scripture and how he was taught and inspired by the Spirit, rightly viewed it from a Christocentric and a Christotelic viewpoint, meaning that all of Scripture points us to Christ, it's centered on Christ, and it all finds its end, its, its final meaning in Christ. That's the Christotelic. As Calvin wrote, Paul very properly quoted the account given of God's ascension and applied it 
to the person of Christ. The noblest triumph which, which God ever gained was when Christ, after subduing sin, conquering death, and putting Satan to flight, rose majestically to heaven that he might exercise his glorious reign over the church. No ascension of God more triumphant or memorable will ever occur than that which took place when Christ was carried up to the right hand of the Father, that he might rule over all authorities and powers and might become the everlasting guardian and protector of his people. So I think Paul, very much so, he doesn't want us to see some textual difficulty in those questions, but he wants us to see what his focus is, and that is on the ascended and reigning Christ. Peter at Pentecost said in his sermon in in chapter 2, verse 33, he said, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you or yourselves are seeing and hearing. See, Christ received, and as that reigning king, he then gave. That's what a reigning king does. He gives to his people. Now, there is another question related to this text that's in verse 8. Actually, I think it's um, in verse 9. Yeah, verse 9, where it says uh, that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. What, What did Paul mean by that? Well, some of the options that have been put forth are that Christ descended into hell. Another is that Christ, uh, that this refers to Christ's descent, not bodily, but through the Spirit after his ascension. And then the, the final one is that it refers to his incarnation, and that includes, of course, his death. Now, I believe the best option is that this speaks of Jesus' incarnation, and, 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 of course, his death. And part of the reason I see that is that verse, um, the, the next verse ex- expresses a necessity for one to descend in order to descend. Okay, there, there's a logic in verses 9 and 10 that, that says the, the one who descended, or the one who ascended, had to also descend. But it, is that... Is that really true? Didn't Elijah, didn't he ascend without having descended first? So why does Paul write this? I mean, Paul is a brilliant, brilliant writer, and he's inspired. That, That logical flaw seems too simple for him to make. And Robert Raymond wrote this, He said, Paul obviously is assuming something about the subject of his remarks. It's a fact so well known and so widely received among the Christians to whom he is writing that it does not need to be spelled out at every turn in his exposition. Now, what is this datum that does not require even the the stating? Because Paul is assured in his own mind that his readers will be able to provide it. Well, Raymond goes on to point out that what is assumed is that the one who has descended, the reason he had to descend was because he already existed outside of that realm from eternity past. Before his time as the incarnate Son of God, he existed as the eternal Son of God. So it does actually logically flow that this eternally existing Son of God had to descend. He had to take on flesh first in order to then ascend. And so Paul actually makes it clear by this logic that Christ is divine, that Christ is God, that Christ is the eternal one. He is God in flesh who came to save rebellious sinners from condemnation by his incarnation. And he is then the one who has also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. And that should take us back to Ephesians 1.10, to verses 20 to 23 in that same chapter that talk about how he does fill all things. And then if we went back to the Old Testament to Jeremiah 23, and 23 and 24, if we, we took the time to read that, that talks about God is the one on high who, has, who fills all things. And so what Paul is continuing to say about Christ points us to his absolute divinity. You see, the ascension, something we don't talk about that much, but the ascension is the proof of Christ's glory and his power, and his sovereignty. And Paul draws this out because what he is saying is that Christ 
Christ is the one who has the full and absolute authority to give gifts, to distribute gifts for his church. So Paul used this reference to show us the glory and power of Christ, but he also gave us a little lesson in how to read scripture and how to approach scripture to see, to see it from that Christ-centered and, and, and Christotelic that, that everything has its end in Christ manner. That all scripture has, as, as one commentator says, his earthly mission and redemption on the cross and his resurrection and exaltation to cosmic supremacy as its central orientation from beginning to end. And I want to say, that's not an aside here, because if you can grasp that, if we can all grasp that truth, I believe that's going to open up our eyes. We will have, it's going to feel like our hearts burning like it did for the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're going to see the the greatness of scripture and the greatness and glory of God. You see, Christ is given gifts because he is the one with power and authority as the ascended king to give those gifts. And verse 11 tells us what those gifts are. It says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And what the ESV does not translate, that I wish it did, is there's an emphatic um, word there that would say, and he himself gave the apostles and so on. It is this risen, this ascended Christ that gave. The gifts are not because of our strength or our ingenuity. They are given by the reigning Christ in his wisdom. So now we turn our attention to verses 11 and 12, and and we see a particular focus, and it's on a, a certain strain of gifting. Now, Paul does not enumerate every gift to the church, really in any of the places that he talks about the different gifts. This is not an exhaustive list. Let me just reiterate, this is not an exhaustive list of the gifts. But Paul does here focus on those gifts. They're all related. They focus on um, the government, the, the operation of the church. And in a particular manner, he focuses on gifts that have a relation to the, the word of God to teaching and expounding the word, to the proclamation of the gospel. And in looking at these gifts that are listed, there is, again, not surprisingly, a little bit of debate on the nature of the gifts and the number of them. And I'm not going to get in the weeds of this because I don't think it's honestly that important. But I will say that I believe that the first two offices listed are almost certainly not in effect anymore. These were foundational offices of the church. Ephesians 2.20 says that the the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They had a very specific role for a specific time. But any further revelation from God, anything new is not occurring. The the faith has been delivered once and for all. Jude 3, we have in God's word the resources to equip us for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And we have all that we need for life and godliness given to us. I believe that's the beginning of 2 Peter. Everything is given to us in Scripture, and the Holy Spirit is at work in us to illumine, not to give us inspiration, but to illumine our hearts and minds to understand God's Word. Now, so I'm going to just move past apostle and prophet and go to the term evangelist. Evangelist is only used two other times in the entire New Testament. 2 Timothy 4, 5 Paul charges Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And in Acts 21.8, Philip is called the evangelist. And perhaps, I mean, we we know this definitely has to do with the spread of the gospel. And so perhaps this is akin to a church planter or uh, a missionary in in a field that is void of gospel witness, which honestly, it's a lot more places than we might at first think. So the work of an evangelist. Well, then comes shepherd or pastor, and teacher. Now the question, there's a question here because of the grammatical structure that Paul used that is this referring to one or to two offices? And I would lean towards it being two offices, but I I will tell you this right now, I'm not dying on that hill. Yeah, I don't think it matters that much. And so what I want to highlight though is the role of the the shepherd pastor and the teacher. So the, the shepherd pastor is there to nurture and care for the congregation. Throughout scripture, 
we, we see God described as a shepherd. He's, uh, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He cares for his people. And that, that picture has been applied to the leaders of God's people, and in the New Testament in particular, and, and really in, in other ways, to the leaders of the church, in general, whether they're good or bad. And we see that in, in Acts 20, 28, in 1 Peter 5, 4, where the, the elders are charged to shepherd the flock of God. And so this idea of shepherding or pastoring involves nurture, it involves care, uh, it certainly involves some counseling, things along those, things that involve still teaching, but really applying um, God's word in grace to people's lives in everyday life situations, whatever those may be. That's, that's the nature of, of caring for, that's being a shepherd. Well, then we have teaching. Teaching, of course, is an exposition of scripture. It is, it's an authoritative function, and the teacher is charged to be faithful and dedicated to apostolic doctrine. See that in 1 Timothy 4 and Titus 1. The teacher is also one who encourages faithful living in line with that doctrine. We'll see that uh, later in Ephesians 4, verses 20 and 21, says, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So encouraging someone to continue to live in line with the truth. Now, clearly the shepherd, the pastor must be able to teach. And we see that throughout scripture. But the reason I, I can go with two offices is because it's not as clear that a teacher has to be able to pastor. But what I, I want to move to is that these officers, these men gifted by God, they're there as gifts for the church. They're not for themselves. They're there as gifts for the church. And that is where verse 12 takes us. They're to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Once again, there's a bit of discussion here in particular, in particular with where commas would be placed in that verse because it makes a huge difference. Should this be translated as the ESV, which I just read, or like the King James Version that says, for the perfecting of the saints, comma, for the work of ministry, comma, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there are two options really that basically fall between the officers of the church, these gifts, doing all the work. That's the King James, the, the way it's translated. Or are they given as gifts to equip the saints, for the saints and them, of course, but for the saints to do the work of service, the work of ministry, all of it, their work and the saints' work for the building up of the body of Christ. Well, I think you can guess very clearly that I fall with the ESV. Paul has consistently, consistently throughout his writing, written of every member ministry of the church and how necessary that is and how much of a privilege it is for us all to contribute the gifts that Christ has in his wisdom given to us. I don't believe in any way Paul could be advocating clericalism where only the ordained clergy, the ordained officers of the church do the work. Because quite simply, that's not every part of working properly. Yet in this, I do think that Paul highlights very much and lifts high the ministry of the word. All the offices that Paul talked about are word-centered. The the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the, the shepherds or pastors and teachers. They are, through the word, to equip and prepare, uh, to, to, to equip, to, to prepare and provide for the saints, all the believers in the church, to be able to do the work of service. To do the work of service of the church and really for one another, serving each other. And all these works, everything when it works together properly, works to the building up, to the strengthening of the body of Christ. Calvin, again, he, he was spectacular on this. He says, no language more highly commendatory of the ministry of the word could have been employed than to ascribe to it this effect. What is more excellent than to produce the true and complete perfection of the church? And yet this work, so admirable and divine, 
is here declared by the apostle to be accomplished by the external ministry of the word. That those who neglect this instrument should hope to become perfect in Christ is utter madness. Yet such are the fanatics, on the one hand, who, who pretend to be favored with secret revelations of the Spirit, and, and then proud men, on the other, who imagine that to them the private reading of the Scriptures is enough, and that they have no need of the ordinary ministry of the church. See, Christ has set it up for gifted men to proclaim God's Word, to equip, to prepare, to strengthen the saints, so that everyone can do the service of ministry and that the, as a result, the body is built up. Folks, this is the wisdom of Christ. This is the manner in which Christ has appointed for the church to grow, to be built up. And we're going to look at this more next time as we continue through this section in Ephesians. But I will say how sad it is when we neglect the ministry of the word. We desperately need to hear this. And we need to hear it through yeah, what Christ has given in wisdom. I need to hear it from others. You need to hear it. We have to have that. As Calvin would say, those who neglect or despise this order choose to be wiser than Christ. I don't think that's a good choice. Folks, we all need the ministry of the church. And as part of that ministry, it's not just the ministry of the word coming from gifted men, but it's from the ministry of all the saints in the church. Everyone gifted, man, woman, boy, girl, child, all of them using the gifts that God has given, that Christ has given, that ascended and reigning Christ, everything that he has given is to be used, and we cannot neglect that ministry. We've all been gifted by Christ for the service, and it's a tremendous privilege. Tremendous privilege. I miss out when you are not there, when you're not a part of the body. You miss out when you are not there. But when we are all there and together working, having been equipped, the body builds itself up in love, and it's a beautiful thing. So then, folks, let us be people who see the beauty of this diversity of gifts in the body of Christ. They've come from Christ, and and let us eagerly use our own gifts. I'm excited to see how you will use your gifts in the church. I've already seen people step up during this crazy time and use gifts that I guarantee you, you would not be watching anything of this quality without other people using their gifts. Um, There'd probably be blank space at the beginning and the end of this recording because I would have no idea how to trim it. People are using it. And and I know that seems small, but the reality is, is there are people stepping up to do it. And I'm excited to see how, especially when we all come back together, but right now for sure, how people are using their gifts in the body of Christ, because it's for benefit. It's so that we can serve and build up that body. Folks, we have, we have an amazing high position as believers. I mean, think about this. We have gone, Paul has called us children of wrath, children destined for wrath. We were at enmity with God. And because of Christ, who is himself our peace, we now are not enemies, but we are actually gifts to the church because we've been gifted by the risen and ascended Christ. We are now invaluable, used for building up the body of Christ. That is the wisdom of God and glory and praise be to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this. And I pray that you would would strengthen us to be people who are willing and eager to use our gifts eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, eager to see the building up of the body of Christ because we trust the wisdom of our Savior who poured out these gifts on his church. God, we pray that you would be glorified in us 
and that we, for our good and the good of others, and, and for our joy, use our gifts by the power of the Spirit at work in us, given to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's through him that we pray. Amen.